I suppose that one of the things that has happened in, in and through a great part of the body of Christ has been the misunderstanding and the out-of-balance out of teaching that has come from some sources on the subject of faith. There has been what has been known across the country as the faith message. I don't know when there's been anything that has been preached in the last decade that has brought any more confusion and difficulty in the minds and the hearts of some people and serious problems in some fellowships across this nation and in various parts of the world. It's for this reason that today I want to introduce the subject of faith and ask you to follow with me in the Word of God. Let the Word be the deciding and the determining factor in where we stand. And then we will never have anything to be concerned about. Now the Bible has a lot to say about faith. The scriptures tell us that if you have faith as the grain, as a grain of mustard seed, or as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and it will happen. It might be of interest to you to know that the word mustard seed is used no less than five times in the New Testament. Twice the word mustard seed refers to the kingdom of God kingdom of God like a mustard seed. One place the scriptures tell us in Matthew that mustard seed is referred to as the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Twice in the Bible, once in Matthew and once in Luke, faith is referred to when Jesus says if you have faith, not the size of mustard seed, but like a mustard seed has, such a small seed that can push through every obstacle and over every hindering force and can break forth as it reaches toward the light and the sun and become a great plant. The scriptures are, are pregnant with references concerning faith. The Bible talks about people who lacked faith. Jesus talked about, O ye of little faith. Paul refers to men and women who are weak in faith. Jesus on two or three occasions talked about great faith. The Bible talks about faith that can be enlarged. James talks about unwavering faith. Peter talks about unfeigned faith, or faith that is not phony. He suggests that there could be phony faith. So there's a lot said about faith, and yet so much that is misunderstood when we talk about faith. Do you know that two times in the Bible the, the scriptures talk about Jesus marveling? I guess a word that we would use was flabbergasted, amazed. On two occasions, once he was, he was amazed, he marveled because of unbelief. He was in his hometown among those that should have known him, and, and the Bible says he marveled that they did not believe, and, and no signs and wonders were wrought there because of their unbelief. On another occasion, occasion Jesus marveled at great faith. When a centurion said, you don't need to come to my house, just say the word. I'm a man of authority, and I know you are, and if you'll just say the word, it'll happen. Jesus said, I marvel. I've not seen faith like this, no place in Israel. So there's a great deal that's said about faith. But I'd like for you to take your pencil and the paper, and we're going to talk about seven kinds of faith. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is all the Bible has to say, but at least it will give us some foundation and some place to start. 
seven kinds of faith. In the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says in verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. Talking about God. It's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Just draw a line under that phrase. But without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God. Now, just flip back there in your New Testament to the book of Romans where the Apostle Paul, in that beautiful chapter, the 10th chapter, talking about faith, uh, says these words in verse 17. He said, So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now let's write down some things and it'll sort of help us, I think, put in perspective something that we can we can really anchor our lives in as Christians. The first kind of faith that I want to talk about is what I would like for you to write down as the source of faith. I'm talking about a body of truth. When a person talks about what is your faith? They're actually saying, what is your doctrinal belief? Of what faith are you? Do you believe like the Baptist? Or do you believe like the Methodist? Do you believe like the Roman Catholics? Do you believe like the Presbyterians? Are you of the Pentecostal faith? What is your persuasion? What is your doctrinal stance? What is your faith? Now, the only way you can have this kind of faith, it is developed through study. We must study the Word of God to determine what we believe. What is your faith? We have to ask ourselves such basics as this. What do I believe about God? What is my faith, my understanding, my doctrine, my teaching, my persuasion concerning God? What is my faith concerning Jesus Christ? What do I believe concerning Him? What is my faith? Is He the Son of God? Is he God manifest in flesh? Is he very God, very man? Is he the Savior? Is he who he says he is? What is your faith? We have to ask ourselves, what do we believe concerning the church? Do we believe that our denomination or our organization, organization, that that is the church? What do we believe the Bible teaches concerning the church? Which organization is right? Who has the authority to baptize you? Who can forgive you of your sin? Who can put you into the church? Who can put you out? What is your faith? What do you believe? What is your persuasion? You see... This is what Jude is talking about when he said we must contend for the faith. This is what Paul, and that's in the third verse of uh, of Jude's letter. And the Apostle Paul, when he talked about having faith that the word must be preached, that faith comes by hearing the word. What does the word say? Our faith must be based on The scripture, thus saith the Lord, what does the Bible say? Not what is men's opinion. So Bible faith must be based on thus saith the Lord. This is the reason there's such an attack on the word of God. Trying to strip and rob people of their faith. You see, it was the Apostle Paul who said, when he came down to the end of his life, I have kept the faith. He was a defender of the faith. He preached the truth. He preached the gospel. 
He wrote the New Testament and stood against every kind of opposition, proclaiming the Word of God so we could have faith. Now, I want to pause here for a moment because the only right a church has to exist, listen, and the only right a church has to exist is to proclaim the Word of God so men and women can have faith in God's Word. And one of the tremendous battles we have in the church is that we don't get caught up in so many side issues that we forget that we have the responsibility to preach the Word of God. That's our job. And constantly, everlastingly, always, without let up, relentlessly, there are forces that try to water us down and sidetrack us to all kinds of things to keep us from preaching, teaching, instructing the Word of God so men can have faith, so women can have faith. Now, that's one facet. This is like a diamond. Faith is like a diamond with many facets. And that's one facet of faith. The source of faith is the Word of God developed in us by study. Now, write down the second kind of faith. First, the source of faith. Now, secondly, I want to talk to you for a moment about saving faith. Saving faith is developed when we do two things. When we repent of our sin and when we publicly confess that Jesus Christ is Savior. Then saving faith is developed in our hearts. Now, you have your Bible there. Let's, let's just take a look at a couple of important verses. I think I'll direct you first to Ephesians chapter 2, and let's look at verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, if there's anything that you ever underline in the Scripture, please underline that. It is the gift of God. This is the measure of faith that comes to every person that repents, that means that they say, I am a sinner, and repenting means I want to turn away from my sin, and I can't do it by myself, so I ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior and to give me victory and power over sin. When we do that, then God gives us the gift of faith. This is the reason we ask you in church to come to a willful decision. Confess your sin, confess Jesus Christ, and you will receive faith. That'll happen to you. It's a gift of God. And you will know when you receive the gift. Let's look over here in 1 Peter. And in the first chapter, listen to this, verse 5. I'll, it's in the middle of a sentence, but you can pick the thought up. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Faith. Faith. Saving faith. I want to read another verse before I make a comment or two. In the third chapter of the book of Galatians, and I want to begin reading with verse 22. I'm going to be exercising some of our technicians today. Listen to this. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. 
But after faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Did you get that? Saving faith. The law could not give us faith. The law was a schoolmaster that brought us to Christ, and when the law pointed to Christ, and we looked to Christ, and received Christ, then we received the gift of faith. And that gift of faith is saving faith. Bill's been talking about the doctrine of salvation, and he's made some statements that need to be, that needs to be repeated over and over again. There are not degrees of saving faith. You're not a little bit saved or someone else is more saved than you are. This faith is a complete gift that assures salvation to us. And either you have saving faith or you don't have. You're either saved or you're not. And if you are saved, you know it. How many are glad today you got saving faith? Thank God. Now, there's, you know, there are a lot of folks that have very little of the source of faith. They know very little about doctrine. They know very little about all of these teachings of the Word of God. But God will drop into them because they repent and come to Jesus, will drop into them saving faith. My father was in the war, and in 1917, he didn't know anything at all about the way of salvation. He only heard someone say, that what he saw in people when he went to a church for the first time and heard the gospel preached, he, he didn't know a thing about salvation. He only heard them say that they had received the Holy Spirit. He didn't know about salvation. So he went and he said, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need something. And I hear these people say, I need the Holy Spirit. And I'm asking you to give me the Holy Spirit. And God saved him because he confessed he was a sinner and acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ. God gave him saving faith. And there are some of you that are listening to me right now. Some of you are in this audience. You don't have to join this church. You don't have to worship the way we worship. You don't have to attend Calvary Temple, but the Spirit of God's dealing with you and trying to get you to confess to God that you're a sinner and to believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And if you will, God will give you the gift of faith and you'll know you're saved. Now, number one, did you get it? Because I want us to write it down so we don't forget it. Source of faith has to do with what we believe, with the body of truth, with doctrine, with our understanding of the Word of God, so we can say, this is my faith. And you can call it Methodist faith or Presbyterian faith or Baptist faith. I don't care what you call it as long as you know it. Then there's saving faith, which is a gift of God. No man will ever have saving faith until he comes to Christ. And here's what the Scripture says. It says, if you come to Christ and, and acknowledge Him as Savior, there is no question. There's no question about it. You will receive the gift of faith. God will give you the gift of faith. He will turn nobody away. You say, have I done something and that I can't deserve it? No. I don't have time to deal with this now. But one of these days I will deal with the unpardonable sin. There are a lot of folks talking about the unpardonable sin. And don't you worry about it. I don't believe that you've committed the unpardonable sin. There's no sin that you'll commit that God won't forgive you of. The moment you can find that thing that God won't forgive you of, you come and tell this preacher and I'll have to quit preaching. There isn't anything that God won't forgive. I'm here glad you're saved. All right. Now, the third one. You got this? The source of faith, saving faith. Now I want to talk to you about sanctifying faith. 
And I think the best place for us to go is to, and, and, and there are just many places to go, but in 1 Peter, be sure you mark this on the first chapter, and listen while we read verse 21. Who by him do believe in God, who raised him, talking about Jesus, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now, I'm talking about a third kind of faith, a third facet, a third quality of faith. It's sanctifying faith. Now, let me explain. The moment that we become a Christian, there are three fabulous forces that begin to impact our lives. Here's the first one. The blood of Jesus Christ which makes us know how terrible sin is, begins to impact our life. There's power in the blood of Christ because it's only by the blood that sin is covered. The second thing that impacts our life is the Word of God. For as we read the Word, we find out that our lives must line up to what the Word says. And the third thing that impacts our lives is the Holy Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. So here is the blood of Christ, here is the Word of God, and here is the Spirit of God that is working in us to produce Christian character in us. This is the reason there are trials. This is the reason there are troubles. This is the reason there are pressures and temptations that come. This is the reason James says, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into these divers' temptations and trials, knowing this, that the trial of your faith worketh patience. Trial of your faith? What is this faith? It's this sanctifying faith that says, God is going to let things happen in my life to bring me to a place where I can manifest the character of Jesus. And he will work on my life through all kinds of pressures. This is the reason I stand up in resistance to people that say, if you have faith, you will not have trouble. It's the opposite. When you have faith, you will have trouble. When you have faith, God is going to cause you and me to be sanctified. He's going to do a work that will cause us to separate from sin and be separated to God. So he begins dealing in us and working through us with a sanctifying faith. I'm going to continue on. This is one of those messages to be continued. But I want us to remember the source of faith. It's our doctrine. It's what we believe about the fundamental truths of the Word of God. That's the reason we've got to find a church that preaches the Word. Some of you are supporting churches where the Word's not preached. And that's a sin. And then we've got to know saving faith is a gift of God. Then we've got to know sanctifying faith, which will bring to us trouble. The more I put my trust in the Lord, the more the sanctifying fire will burn. The more God will deal in my life to try to bring me so I'll come and measure up to what Christ wants me to be. Sanctifying faith. Now, my time is gone. But let's just sort of hang right there. And next Sunday we'll start. Because I want you to get to the other four. Facets of faith. 
so we can put this in perspective, not be carried off out here with every wind and every slide of dark, slide of doctrine, doctrine that will confuse us and rob us and, and bring us to a place of defeat. I want you to know that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. Because I've got saving faith. And I'm just as saved as if I was already in heaven. This concludes side one. This series continues on side one of the next tape.